Are you sure you want to read the Bible more? Before starting, I want to say that I treat this lecture as a podcast. You can just listen to this in the background. I'm also treating Christianity as true, not academically inclined. The pastor was going to close the college Bible study that week, so I substituted for him, and this is what I shared in a more organized fashion. So on to the show. For many Christians, there comes a time when they feel like they should read the Bible more. Sometimes it's a new convert wanting to figure out what's happening. More often than not, it's a guilty pain of conscience. In all of this, there's a hidden dynamic of betrayed expectations, methodologies, and shame. It's time to cultivate greatness and to an answer every Christian should hear. There are a few different ways that you can go about this. First, you can pick a Bible book, read it, and write down your questions and pester the pastor for answers. This works best for spontaneous study. Second, many like starting to read one of the Gospels. Former Jews or Jews by heritage often like starting with Matthew for all the Old Testament references. Mark is the shortest gospel and is meant to leave the reader thinking that Jesus is either crazy or is who he claims to be. It is excellent for agnostic and atheist people and believers who feel like they are fighting against God. Luke is written like a documentary of the day with interviews and fact-checking. It's popular among historians and one of the most common Gospels to be read around Christmas and Easter. John is a book written for Christians and often contains details and concepts that are great for new and old converts alike. The third thing is topical. Now this should be split into several different groups. Some feel like they are lacking in wisdom, and so they should read Proverbs. If you want to pray more but don't know where to start, start with the Psalms. Say, Dear God, read the psalm out loud, and then finish by saying Amen. I love plants. One of the ways that I got into reading the Bible more was to find all the times that plants were mentioned in the Bible. That led me to numbers and the later part of this work. If you have an excessive personality quirk, like temper, temptations, or kleptomania, or something like that, feel free to ask a pastor with some verses to help you out, if not entire Bible chapters. Now some want to confess faith, but don't know how to say it well. Feel free to take inspiration from Acts chapter 26, where Paul talks to a ruler about how he came to believe what he now does. Now obviously this is one of those things that you cannot copy word for word, but the idea is to be concise and tell the truth, even if it doesn't make you look good. Don't exaggerate, and let the events speak for themselves. There is also some funny stuff in the Old and New Testament. Joshua 8 is titled The Fall of Ai, which is fulfilled twice. Once then, the second fulfillment will come when we defeat the Terminators. <laughs> I love my jokes. Judges 3, 12 through 30 tells of Ehud. There are so many hilarious things happening here. Ehud is left-handed despite being a tribe of known as the sons of the right hand, the king is so fat the sword disappears into his body, the king's advisors think the dead king is using the restroom, and waits an uncomfortably long time before they check up on him to discover his death. First Samuel 3, when Samuel is called to be a prophet, is a special type of adorable silly. Daniel 3 takes a horrible situation, being burned alive by a tyrant, and through repetition has entire sections that read like Dr. Seuss writing adult horror. It's morbidly funny, and a modern reader can find laugh out loud, adorable cuteness, and even situational sarcasm in these books. Ask a pastor for their favorite funny moments. Now most articles end here. And that's good enough for most, yet some questionable assumptions are underlying everything. There is this temptation in Christianity. If you haven't been praying lately in your daily life, suffering is increasing, you must pray. God will make your dreams come true if you pray often and hard enough. You're just one prayer away from Jesus saving you from suffering. Treating the divine as a prayer in, goodness out, ATM is tempting. And the Bible wants us to reconsider this. 
Job, Exhibit A. God blesses Job. Satan comes to God and wants to make Job suffer. Weirdly enough, God agrees. Sure, Job is rewarded at the end, but Job in the first five chapters does not know how his last chapter ends. What makes you think this has only happened to Job? You might be suffering because God the Father allows his faithful to suffer. Exhibit B, Numbers 11, verse 5. I believe it is the only time cucumbers are mentioned in the Bible. For context, the Israelites have fled Egyptian slavery and are headed to the Promised Land. Along the journey, God gives the people bread. He seeks you out and gives you bread. The people are unhappy and wish for fish, cucumber, melons, leeks, and garlic. For us reading today, that seems unreasonable. God seems so much closer then than now. Quit your complaining. But really, think about what that complaint actually means. Meat is expensive food. Cucumbers were used as ice cubes in a time before fridges. Melons were a sweet treat like candy. Leeks, onions, and garlic cloves were painkillers and food seasoning. The Israelites were complaining about losing their modern conveniences. And that does sound like a modern people. They would rather have the mortal food in their slavery and reject the divine freedom bread of God. Today in seminaries, there is a joke. It is easier to believe that God is in the bread and wine than it is to believe that the bread wafers are bread. If you ever seen those bread wafers, you know. Who among us would be willing to give up cinnamon rolls, tortillas, sliced bread, burger buns, donuts, and croutons to eat the God-filled dried wafer? Exhibit C, the stoning of Stephen. Any of the apostles really works here. And think about it. The twelve apostles, those closest to Jesus, should have had wonderful lives. Now, Judas hangs himself and his guts explode in worms, but he does betray Jesus, so one disciple having a bad end makes sense. But out of the original twelve disciples and the one that replaces Judas, only one of the apostles dies of old age. Everyone else is like Stephen. The friends of Jesus die horrifically. Exhibit D, the many books of the Corinthians. So Paul writes to the church in Corinth telling them that they are taking the Lord's Supper so wrongly that the people are dying. Throughout the New Testament, some believers get punished for the sins of misusing the gifts of God. You can also see this in Acts as well as in Revelation. Perhaps the most difficult proof that God allows his people to suffer can be found again in Israel, the nation. Remember Numbers, how God is leading people to the Promised Land? Well, the Promised Land existed during the Bronze Age and that time frame. To make bronze, mix around 90% copper and 10% tin. The three Middle Eastern superpowers, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the Hittites, all had a struggle. See, Egypt and Mesopotamia had copper mines but lacked tin. The Hittites had tin. The three powers traded with each other to make tools of agriculture, musical instruments, and weapons of war. To trade too much of your resource was to risk empowering your enemy. It was an uneasy alliance. And to make things worse, Israel is one of the few places outside of the Hittite territory with tin. Why trade with the Hittites for Egypt and Mesopotamia when you could just take all the tin you wanted from a weaker nation? For the Hittites, why not conquer the southern area of Israel and form a monopoly on tin? If any of the powers went to war, they would naturally fight in or near Israel, causing collateral damage. Not only did the Israelites have to fear external powers, they also had to fear internal problems. In the book of Judges, many tribes raid and oppress the people. These tribes are not just nomadic herders. Now, many would have fought to own the tin mines, with the enslaved people, the enslaved Jews, who worked them. God's promised land is not a mortal, peaceful paradise for his chosen people. It is a land that will repeatedly force the people to depend on trusting God. It's a land of physical struggle that bears spiritual fruit. God has no qualms about condemning your body to save your soul. That's the point. At this point, you might be saying, when I don't go to church and read the Bible, I feel guilty. But if God is not guaranteed to make my life better when I start going back to church and reading the Bible, then why go back at all? That right there is the gospel of Satan. Despair. 
God lets you feel shame if and when you don't go to church or read the Bible. In the ancient world, it was difficult to run from your problems. Becoming a thief or a bad worker meant that you had to risk their judgment and condemnation. Being kicked out of the tribe meant death in the age of bronze. Shame was the biologically induced motivator to increase your desire for group cohesion so that you did not die. As miserable as experiencing shame is, it was meant to be an emotion to motivate you to deal with the problem quickly. It looks very different in the modern day. Imagine you are a man, which isn't difficult for half of us, and you see a pretty lady. You want to flirt with her with a saucy joke. The loose skin on your elbow is called a weenus, for those that don't know. You approach her, and she's so beautiful that when she turns to look at you, you fumble your words. And now you feel ashamed that you'll never ever go back to that grocery store ever again. How could you have said such a stupid thing? In the modern day, you can go to a new grocery store. You can hide from your shame much easier than ever before, and that's what Satan wants you to do. When you feel the shame of not attending church, God is not just trying to motivate you to embrace his gifts of salvation, eternal life, and wisdom. Satan is there promising you the gospel of despair, that if you will just feel better if you read even less and go to church even less. For the believer, listening to Satan does not stop sickness, aging, or death. It just guarantees hell afterward. You don't read the Bible as a believer, treating God like a slot machine. It's brilliant instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. If you want to read the Bible, but are so deep in shame it's hard to do, you can rely on the surprise fourth method. Read a single verse, and that's it. Randomly open your Bible, just read one verse today, and that's it. Do the same thing tomorrow, and again, over time, you'll get more comfortable reading more verses. Eventually, you'll want to read more and more. Don't rush it. When it happens, it happens. One day, you can return to the grocery store, retell the joke, and maybe even get a bit of respect from her for, like, bouncing back from an embarrassing situation. I should also note that when people strengthen their morals, think through what they believe, and maintain it for a long enough period of time, they tend to have their priorities in good order. Those good priorities tend to make life easier by addressing the many problems or adding more meaning to your life. And would you look at that? The God willing to condemn your body to save your soul is also willing to take care of your body. Huh. It's like God is against business transactions and actually wants a saving relationship with you. It's like God's gospel is one of hope. Huh. Neat how it all works out. Anyways, this is the end of the lecture. Please support me and what I'm trying to do by either purchasing one of my works or visiting my website. You could also subscribe, like, share this around with some of your fellow Christian buddies who need some encouragement in, in reading more of the Bible. And until next time, well, let's all go and cultivate some greatness.